Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Ulrich, director of NYU Washington, DC, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's event on behalf of the NYU's John Bradamus Center and Random House. The NYU DC Salon Series is made possible through the collaboration of NYU schools, departments, and special relationships with selected external organizations like Random House. Random House Big Ideas Night Series is a forum for thought-provoking conversations between writers and editors on politics, world affairs, technology, social justice, philanthropy, and more. These dialogues offer exclusive access for guests to dive deeper into issues with fellow readers and engage directly with the innovators addressing them. Our honored guests tonight include our moderator, James Homan, as well as authors, Pete Peter Baker and Timothy Neftali. In collaboration with John Meacham and Jeffrey Engel, they wrote Impeachment, an American History, published by the Modern Library, a division of Random House. This book will be the focus of the evening's event and is available for purchase. James Homan, our moderator, is a national political correspondent for the Washington Post. He is the author of The Daily 202, the Post's flagship political newsletter, and the voice of its affiliated Big Idea audio briefing. He's covered local news for the Post and returned in 2015 after six years at Politico. He has also written for the Los Angeles Times, Dallas Morning News, and San Jose Mercury News. A historian by training, he graduated with honors from Stanford University. With a joint appointment in history and at Wagner, Tim Neftali is a clinical associate professor of public service and a clinical associate professor of history. He is a graduate of Yale with a doctorate of history from Harvard and writes on national security intelligence policy, international history, and presidential history. He and Russian academic Alexander Fersenko wrote the prize-winning One Hell of a Gamble, Khrushchev, Castro, and Kennedy, 1958 to 1964, and Khrushchev's Cold War, the latter winning the Duke of Westminster's Medal for Military Literature in 20, 2007, an inclusion on Foreign Affairs 2014 list of the 10 best books on the Cold War. As a consultant to the 9-11 Commission, he wrote a history of US counterterrorism policy, published as The Blind Spot, the his Secret History of American Counterterrorism. He was the founding director of the Federal R Richard Nixon Presidential Library, and where he authored the library's nationally acclaimed exhibit on Watergate. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Slate, and Foreign Affairs, and he's also seen regularly on television and as a commentator on contemporary history. Peter Baker graduated from Oberlin College and is the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, responsible for covering President Trump, Trump, the fourth president, he has covered. He's also covered President Obama for the Times and Presidents Clinton and President George W. Bush for the Washington Post. He joined the Times in 2008 after 20 years at the Post. In between stints at the White House, he and his wife, Susan Glaser, spent four years as Moscow bureau chiefs for the Post. He is the author of five books, including Obama, The Call of History, a finalist for an ND NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work, Days of Fire, Bush and Cheney in the White House, which was named one of the five best nonfiction books of 2013 by the New York Times Book Review. The Breach, Inside the Impeachment and the Trial of William Jefferson Clinton, a New York Times bestseller, and with Miss Glaser, Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the End of Revolution, which was named one of the best books of 2005 by the Washington Post Book World. He is currently working on a biography of former Secretary of State James A. Baker III, which he will write for Doubleday with Miss Glazer. It'll probably win an award if I can pick anything. <laughs> <laughs> he has won all three major awards devoted to the White House reporting, the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Coverage of the Presidency, twice, the Aldo Beckman Memorial Award, twice, and the Merriam Smith Memorial Award. He is also a political analyst for MSNBC and a regular panelist on PBS's Washington Week. And their bios were so rich, these were the edited versions. So you're in for a treat tonight. So please join me in welcoming our guests. We really are lucky to have two uh, esteemed presidential historians, really. And uh, uh, Peter sort of works by, he moonlights as a, as a journalist, too. Uh, I'm very excited for this Baker book. That'll be great. Uh, and, and if you haven't gotten a chance to read this impeachment book that's just come out, it's really fantastic. Uh, I, I'm not sure we would have gotten quite the crowd for an impeachment conversation three or four years ago. Uh, and I, I and we'll take questions. I'd be surprised if Donald Trump didn't come up later. But Trump isn't mentioned in the book, and uh, and and that's that's part of its strength. He's not mentioned in your chapters. He's mentioned in the introduction and conclusion. And uh, and and I think, you know, 
you talk about in your chapter with Richard Nixon, you know, no one was alive when Andrew Johnson was impeached. One vote short of acquittal. Uh, it, during the Clinton impeachment, they had a lot of people had, had been around, had, had seen uh, Watergate play out, had been involved in Watergate. Hillary Clinton had worked on the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, and, and so I think there's a lot we can learn from these two impeachment episodes that have happened uh, in, in many people in this room's lifetimes. And, uh, and I, I guess one of the things that's most striking in reading both of your chapters is that this is a political process, not a legal one. Uh, that you know, that it, it, there's not, there's nothing in the Constitution that you know that it, there's there's obviously high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, but there's not a, a definition of what that means. And this is a rare process. No president has ever been removed from office by impeachment. And uh, and I was hoping you could both sort of talk about the areas you wrote on and and the extent to which it was more political than legal. Uh, well, I, I wanted, first of all, thanks, James, and thank you, Michael. It's great to be here, and it's nice to be with Peter. This was a virtual collaboration. Uh, we did not sit together in one room and do these chapters, although they mesh together, I think, really well. Um, well, uh, I want to take you back in history to a time when impeachment was viewed as uh, a tool that you didn't ever use. And one of the surprises for me in, in looking at the Nixon story was how the leadership of the Democratic Party, and by the way, in that era, 1973, the Democrats were in the majority in both the House and the Senate. They didn't want to touch impeachment. This is, you know, these are months, months after the break in the Watergate in the summer of 1972. You'd had a Senate Watergate committee that had looked at these issues. You learned about the enemies list, you learned about the taping system. You learned about uh, Nixon having, uh, or his people at least, having hired uh, spies uh, to go after Ted Kennedy. A lot of that material, a lot of the dirty tricks information had come into the open. And of course, there were all kinds of questions about the relationship between the committee to reelect the president and the Watergate burglars. And yet, nobody, no Democratic leader wanted to start impeachment hearings or an inquiry. And that was because impeachment was viewed as just something that was, you just didn't do. The Andrew, the Andrew Johnson um, precedent was a negative precedent. So, so my story begins with what pushes the American people over the edge and congressional leaders, including some Republicans, to think about impeachment. And that was the Saturday Night Massacre. That's when the president, in this case Nixon, tries to end an independent investigation of the Watergate crime. And the American people, not just, de not just Democrats, the American people said, hey, that's not right. Now, that didn't mean they were in favor of impeachment, uh, but that meant that they were in favor of at least investigating the president's conduct. So there was like a psychological boundary that Richard Nixon pushed the American people over. Um, and from that point on, and I mean, you know, Peter needs to, needs to add something right now, but and from that point on, the, the whole process is political, but political in the sense that the members of both parties felt it necessary to be able to justify to their constituents their decision. Now, there were partisans, by the way, who had already made up their minds, Republicans and Democrats. There were Republicans who were not going to vote for any article of impeachment. I'm talking about the, on, in the House. And there were Democrats who were absolutely couldn't wait to impeach Nixon. <laughs> but my story is not about them. They're not interested. My story is about the people who made the difference in the middle. Um, and they were important. And, uh, one of the most exciting aspects of my research over the summer was going and finding the diaries of those Republicans who voted against the president and those conservative Democrats in the South whose constituents were pro-Nixon, who were part of Nixon's base because of the Southern strategy, who also voted against Nixon. And it was why they did it, uh, which was in a sense the journey that I had to take to show why the Nixon impeachment was a model impeachment. Uh, Tom DeLay referred to impeachment as the campaign, uh, and, and you've made clear President Clinton saw it that way, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, can you hear me again? Yeah. Oh, it's not. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you to NYU and everybody here for having me as well. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm really delighted to be with James, who has basically become, in the last few years, Washington's number one moderator of, of conversations uh, with many more interesting people than we are, honestly. Uh, you should go to everything he, he hosts. Uh, and Tim, I'm hoping to grow up someday to be 
uh, Tim Neftali. He, he does what, it, uh, what I love the most, which is to take time and really dig deep into fascinating presidential history. I, my digging deep usually consists of about 13 minutes before the editors are screaming, <laughs> where's that story? <laughs> so any chance to have a longer conversation that we're having tonight is, 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 a, is, a, is a great treat. Uh, the Clinton impeachment does draw from the Nixon impeachment, as James said, because th there was this live memory of it. Uh, so many of the players, as, as he mentioned, not just Hillary, had been involved in some way or another. People still in Congress, uh, people who were you know, in the judiciary, who were, who were uh, uh, even on Supreme Court. And um, it was this sort of 25 year later, you know, look back at, okay, wh what are the boundaries? What does it mean to be uh, a high crime and misdemeanor? And that's something we have struggled with each and every time we've come up with this in our history. What does this mean? Because we don't know. The fact framers were very nice. They came up with this felicitous phrase. They didn't provide an appendix that told us what they meant by it. And so each time we reinvent that definition, Gerald Ford famously said that a high crime and misdemeanor means whatever a majority of the House of Representatives says it means. <laughs> uh, and therefore, it is a political process, because that's not a judicial standard. Any, any legal standard, any lawyer would tell you that a law means something pretty defined, and we can tell you uh, from case to case how to, how to apply it. It's different each time we come to an impeachment. And it is a campaign. Tom DeLay did call it the campaign, capital T, capital C. President Clinton did view it as a campaign. And it was all about, for his, in his case, winning over those Democrats, not the Republicans, but the Democrats, his own party, to make sure it stayed as partisan an affair as it possibly could. Because he knew as long as it was a party line thing that he will stay in office, because there would never be a, enough to get a two-thirds vote in the Senate. So the, the, the strategy on the Democratic side, ironically, was to make it more partisan, not less, and to then accuse the other side of being partisan. And the other side, very happily, walked right into that because they were partisan. <laughs> and it's one of these things where both sides had the same interest leading to different, uh, for, for different reasons with a goal that didn't uh, uh, work out the same for each of them. So uh, my basic summary of the Clinton impeachment is, in this book is really interesting to read the Andrew Johnson treatment first by John Meacham, which is just fabulous, and to read Tim Naftali's amazing treatment of Nixon, where I actually learned, I've read so many books about Watergate, and I still learn something new uh, by reading Tim, so I, it's so worth your time. And then you come to the Clinton impeachment. So if the Andrew Johnson impeachment has is, is been discredited in history because it's seen as political, in effect, they had a policy disagreement with Johnson. They thought he was a, uh, uh, too soft in the South. He wasn't enforcing Reconstruction. He was selling out the freed slaves. Uh, Nixon's impeachment was a clear-cut case of abuse of power, right? He used the, the, the forces of government for his own political gain and to, to take down his enemies. And then you had Clinton, which is somewhere in the mushy middle, right? It's, it's political, but you know, is it central to the health of our republic, right? He commits perjury, arguably, and obstruction of justice in a civil lawsuit that's not about his conduct in office. It's about the Paula Jones sexual harassment lawsuit where he's obligated by a judge to tell the truth, and he doesn't. Can a president break the law? Well, why should a president be above the law? But is it enough to muster to the impeachment vote to remove him from office? That's the question. And that's why I think it's kind of this interesting one, because it is a case study between the, the two previous ones. I want to jump off that. We can jump in with each other and have a conversation. And, and eventually, I want to get to questions, too, because you know, it's, it's sort of unimaginable today, looking back, when you read your chapter, to imagine people like Bill Cohen from Maine, uh, who ended up supporting the Articles of Impeachment. Larry Hogan Sr., the father of the current governor of Maryland, uh, you know, was w voted uh, to to advance it at a committee. And 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 as you said, it was a it 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 wasn't inevitable. You know, you make the case if we didn't have tapes, we probably wouldn't have had uh, an impeachment resolution. And and there's a lot of always in, in history what ifs. But can you talk a little bit more about how Democrats were able to make it a seemingly less than partisan process that that we we obviously today conservative Democrats are Republicans, uh, but it, there's so much that just seems so foreign even you know forty some years later. Well, the first thing that Peter Rodino did, uh, was, who was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, is he decided. Um, that uh, 
he was not going to use the committee staff, because you know all committees have staff, and the chairs of committees have staff. He was not going to use the existing committee staff to run the inquiry, because he thought it was too partisan. So he, so, and, and that, by the way, was put him at odds with some of the top partisans in his own party. I mean, he, throughout this, as I learned, throughout this process, there, there are these, these Democrats, who, these partisan Democrats who are putting pressure on the chair to just go faster, go faster, go faster, and impeach Nixon for all kinds of things, for his Vietnam policy, for his, for his uh, tax evasion. Uh, whereas Rodino realized that this wouldn't work if Republicans didn't support impeachment, that if you couldn't get Republicans in the House, you weren't going to get them in the Senate. So from the get-go, he did a bunch of things to ensure uh, a bipartisan approach, or not ensure, but at least to make more likely a bipartisan approach. So what did he do? First thing he did, he hired a new chief counsel for the inquiry, and he hired a Republican. He went out and made a point of hiring John Doerr, a Republican, who had been originally, uh, uh, he'd been appointed by the the Department of Justice in the Eisenhower administration. Now, he's more famous for what he did during the Bobby Kennedy years when he was still at, the, at Justice, but he was one of those civil servants who could work happily for either a Republican or a Democrat. So he's the, the head of the impeachment inquiry. Second thing, he decided there wouldn't be a minority and a majority staff. There would be only one staff for the inquiry, Republicans and Democrats alike, which is how Bill Weld, who would later become governor of Massachusetts, became friendly with Hillary Rodham, who of course becomes Hillary Rodham Clinton, and it's why Bill Weld was nominated to be an ambassador. Sadly, didn't happen, but ambassador, I think, to Mexico by President Bill Clinton. So friendships between Republicans and Democrats happen in the committee because committee in the inquiry group because the inquiry staff was uni united. Imagine if Congress would have staffs that were not majority and minority, but were unified. So you, that was two. The other thing that they did is that they would call members of the uh, 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 Repub uh, Republican members of the, of the committee. Uh, John Doerr and the chair would just call them. How are you doing? How do you feel about the new material? What else do you need? Now, the idea that a chair, because they're very regal in the House, or at least they used to be, that a chair would call some, not only a backbencher, but a backbencher for the other party was unheard of, but it happened. Now, how do we know these things? Because, uh, and this is what, it's very moving actually to know, to learn this. There were a number of the members of this committee, and by the way, this was not a star committee. Uh, the top people in the, in, the history, in, the, in the Democratic and Republican Party didn't choose the Judiciary Committee. You had some lawyers who chose it, and Southerners chose it for civil rights reasons, but most people avoided it. It's where you put fresh, freshman uh, members of Congress. Um, I mean, Elizabeth Holtzman, for example, who defeated uh, the previous chair, okay? Um, she uh, was put on the committee, uh, not because it was a powerful position, but it was a place where you put, where you put freshman members of Congress. And that's why, a, you know, it, AOC, for example, uh, from Queens, I guess, in Brooklyn, uh, she would be put on that committee in that, you know, if you were looking for a parallel today. So, for, for, uh, from the beginning, these members had access to the chair. And we know this because they realized what they were doing was important, and many of them kept diaries. Imagine members of Congress keep, uh, keeping diaries. One of them, a conservative Republican uh, from Virginia, he actually represented Roanoke, uh, a man named Caldwell Butler, he kept an audio diary about 25 hours, and I was fortunate uh, uh, to be able to use it for this book. And he didn't know how impeachment would, would come out. So you're listening to him grapple with the issue. And one thing that made the Republican and swing Democratic voters um, similar was they all began to say to themselves, either in the diaries or in the audio diary, I am a constitutional officer now. I am no longer a member of a party. I have a responsibility as a member of Congress to do my constitutional duty, which is to be a juror in a grand jury. That in a sense, I have to sit here and I have to look at this material as if I were a juror and I have to decide whether the president should be indicted, because that's really what an impeachment is. It's an indictment by the House 
and then conviction or are, are not a trial in the Senate. And, and what they all came to conclude, this middle group, was that they were constitutionalists and they had an obligation to the Constitution of the United States regardless of what their constituents believed. And a number of them concluded that they might lose their seats because of the way they voted. Now, I don't know if there was something in the water in 1974 that made it possible. And I'm not one to believe that the DNA of this country has been somehow diluted so it couldn't happen again. But there, it was the pressure cooker of 1974 that I think created, allowed people, uh, to use a term that our co-author uses, <coughs> to find their better angels. I suspect that can happen again. It's hard to imagine, but I just don't think this country has changed so fundamentally since the 70s that people wouldn't recognize their constitutional duty. In any case, they did in the 70s. And the story is really, really inspiring. It, it is. To the degree it has changed, I think that's a result of the legacy of Watergate and the decline in trust in institutions and the hyper-partisanship. But it, one of the things, the similarities, the thread is Leon Jaworski and Ken Starr both wrote draft indictments of the president, or made the case, they wrote memos explaining why they could indict the president. Except that Jaworski's wasn't useful. Right, well, and I, mean, I want to no, 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 talk the, about the that. Irony, the irony of this, because we talk about the roadmap, and yeah, I it wasn't the useful. Yeah. It, 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 they, the committee didn't like it because, because it was a criminal indictment. And what they came to conclude was, just because the president commits a crime, you don't necessarily remove him. Now, it's all been flipped around now, and it's, everyone says you have to prove the president committed a crime. What they, I'm talking about the middle people. I'm not interested in the partisans on either side. Because by the, part of, by the way, the partisans on the Republican side, most of them flipped after the smoking gun transcript came out. But, but what interested me is why the people in the middle, who might lose their jobs, because that, that's interesting, decided to vote against the president. And they concluded that high crimes and misdemeanor means that the president's conduct is challenging the future of our Constitution. And, that, and, that, and that's what it was. That the, for them, it was, do we condone this behavior? And if we condone this behavior, are we not asking future presidents to undermine the basic fabric of this, of this republic? That's how they concluded what high crimes and misdemeanor were. It wasn't that they decided this particular crime, well, that's a bad one, and this is not so bad. No, they decided, is the conduct, is it basic conduct um, injurious to the, the, the health of our republic? And then they said yes. Uh, a young lawyer named Brett Kavanaugh worked for uh, uh, Ken Starr when they were, they were kind of grappling with some of these questions that are coming up now. Is a president indictable uh, you know, in criminal court? Uh, in both cases, uh, in the case of Nixon and Clinton, the Supreme Court had to make decisions about uh, both, I guess, discovery and privilege and uh, can you talk about that dynamic a little bit? Yeah. Uh, you mean the privilege issues? Or, or just the, 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 the litigate, the, the indicting the of a sitting president yeah, and the yeah. litigate and the, how those factors well, weighed is, on This the, is on the thing. Star. The framers uh, didn't give us a roadmap on whether or not a president could be indicted while he or she is in office, right? They did provide impeachment as um, uh, an out clause if we decided that the president was guilty of something injurious to the republic. Now, there was a debate, this is actually Jeff Engel's part of the book, so pardon me for stealing his thunder, but there was a debate uh, at the convention over whether or not they should introduce the phrase maladministration to this impeachment clause, right? Should a president be subjected to impeachment for treason, bribery, or maladministration? What does maladministration mean? It means you're a bad president, right? We think you stink. Um, and James Mattis, that was George Mason, of course. You've heard of George Mason, who has the, the university here named after him. He thought maybe that was a good idea. James Madison said no. He thought that was a bad idea. It would subject the president to the whims and effect of the Senate, who would be a very parliamentary type of, of, uh, of, of construct there. And we don't have a parliamentary system here. You don't have votes of confidence. You get a four-year term, you're going to serve four years absent something extraordinary. So they took that out. In so George Mason came up with a compromise of, high crimes and misdemeanors to say treason and bribery isn't the only thing that we should want to remove a president from office uh, for. So um, the Clinton case becomes complicated because he 
let's just say he's guilty of everything he's been accused of, okay? Let's just, because that's the issue that's really interesting, right? Let's just say he committed perjury and he, and he obstructed justice. He did it in a private lawsuit that didn't have to do with his office. It had to do with sex. That cheapened the whole thing to a lot of people, right? Why are we drumming a president out of office over what basically amounts to a dalliance in his marriage? Hillary Clinton should be mad at him, but not the public. And that's a very good argument, one that actually sold very well for him. In fact, his, unlike Nixon, whose popularity numbers went down, down, down to the point where he was finally underwater and couldn't, couldn't recover, Clinton's popularity actually went up during his sex scandal. It's actually true. He was around 60% when it started. The day after impeachment, it went up even further. Okay? The public didn't like his behavior. They decided he was not a particularly moral guy. They basically came to the conclusion, not a good husband, pretty good president. All right? So we're going to make that distinction. The public is able to make a distinction. But the trick is, if you're a member of Congress, if you're one of these people in the middle that Tim is talking about, if you're a, trying to f wrestle with your responsibility as a constitutional officer, how do you hold accountable a president who has committed a crime that is not maybe so outrageous that he needs to be removed from office? Because you're probably not going to indict him, right? We haven't settled that issue 100%, but we haven't done it yet. And um, that became then this whole big debate during the Clinton era of could you find some middle ground, something like censure. Censure was done once before in our republic. Andrew Jackson was censured by the Senate. They had a fight over whether he would give them documents related to the Bank of, of the United States. He wouldn't. They censured him. Doesn't have any practical effect, but it's considered to be you know, a, a powerful statement, especially if both houses of Congress did it and both houses were bipartisan. It might have carried some real weight in history had they done that. Tom DeLay, master of the campaign, made sure they didn't do that. He knew if censure was an option on the floor that many Republicans would rush there as, uh, as an escape clause. They wouldn't have to vote for impeachment. Many Democrats would as well. He didn't want that. He wanted there to be an impeachment vote. So he orchestrated this series of letters that basically took censure off the table and required, forced all members of Congress in the House to vote for or against impeachment. And in the end, People struggle with that. I can't let him off the hook for a crime, even if the crime seems cheap and, and tawdry and not injurious to the public. Or on the same side, the, Repu the Democratic side, I don't want to be part of some partisan witch hunt. I don't want to be part of, part of this, uh, this effort. And it was never inevitable that he was going to get off, right? We talked about that with Nixon. It wasn't inevitable this was going to happen. It wasn't inevitable with, with, with Clinton either. What he worried about was the Democrats. He knew the Democrats could do to him what Hugh Scott and Barry Goldwater and, uh, and John uh, uh, Rhodes, right. right, did with Nixon. They came to the White House and said, it's enough, sir. You're, you're done. There's no more support for you in the party. You have to go. He, and he did. That's what Bill Clinton was afraid of the entire time. And there were moments where that really could have happened. The Democrats were very angry with him. They thought that he was, that he was uh, a rogue and he had, he had uh, uh, jeopardized all of them as a party and as a country to some extent. And their agenda, their policy agenda, for what? For, for, for to satisfy a base instinct that he couldn't control or that he should have controlled. Um, so there were moments where it could have gone the other direction. I want to ask about, uh, <laughs> I want to ask about the star report. Just, yeah. you know, we're, we're sort of, Bob Mueller's doing his thing. We'll see what comes of that. We'll, we'll see if, if there's a public Mueller report. Uh, we just, you mentioned the roadmap, which I'll ask you about in a second. Uh, that sort of the instructions, and you can explain what it was. But the the Star report, I think, is one of the reasons that the Clinton impeachment is considered such a tainted sort of process. And it, as you mentioned, it was about sex, and there's the details in there. How did the Star report come to be? Why was it so detailed? Uh, was that inevitable? And was that a, a Ken Starr decision, or was that? kind of uh, Republicans on the Hill wanted that level of specificity and they, they were sort of egging them on. Obviously, Starr was sort of wrapping up his investigation when he learned about Monica et al. and went down that road. Yeah. Um, the Starr report, for those who are too young to remember it and for those of us who are too old to uh, remember it, uh, was about 400 pages of, of summary that he sent the Congress of his investigation into the Monica Lewinsky affair and whether the president lied or, or, or under oath or uh, obstructed justice to, to cover it up in the Paula Jones case. It was very explicit. It gave 
chapter and verse on each sexual encounter that the two of them had, who did what to whom. Uh, there were things in the index that I would still not want my 13-year-old to see. Um, and the, in some ways, basically, Bill Clinton drew them into the trap, right? Because he had lied to the country for so long, I didn't have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, you, you might remember him saying on TV, that they felt, and then even under the grand jury testimony, he says, well, I didn't have sex with her if you use this definition that the lawyers were using, yeah. right? Trying to parse what counts as sex, all right? I don't know about you, in my household, if I did the things that he did with Monica Lewinsky, my wife would consider that sex. <laughs> and in this parsing game, the star people fell into this trap of having to, in their view, prove that under any definition, this is sex. And so they got into ridiculously precise, you know, and almost pornographic detail about what had happened in order to show, see, he's lying. And in doing so, it all backlashed, right? Now, they didn't know the House was going to release it. This is one of these things where, they, you know, we think that the star Republicans, because there were Republicans in the star thing, and the Republicans in the House were somehow aligned in this great, vast right-wing conspiracy. No, they were not, actually. If they were, they would have handled it better. They sent the report to the Congress in a closed, sealed box, and they, they assumed that the Republicans who led the Congress at that time would review it before deciding what to release. The Congress, both sides, were so afraid of letting anybody read this before it was released to the public, because any leaks would then be blamed on each other, you know, the Republicans would leak the parts that were damaging to Clinton, the Democrats would leak the parts that were helpful to Clinton. They just decided, look, in the, in the interest of, of sparing ourselves this, we will release the thing sight unseen, <laughs> right? All right? This is not thought to be one of the greatest acts of Congress in history. <laughs> and uh, it was a bipartisan act, of, uh, uh, by the way, and so bipartisanship is not always a good thing. Uh, and they released the thing sight unseen. So you have this scene with Candy Crowley on CNN reading live from the report, which has just been released, and she's reading out loud things, and she's like literally blushing as she's reading them. And, and, and people can't believe these words are being said on live television. Nobody had a chance to digest it, censor it, edit it, whatever. We, pu we published it in the Washington Post, every word, your paper. Don Graham himself, the owner of the paper, made the decision about whether we would use every word or not. He said, we have no choice. But there were incredibly graphic things that the Washington Post has certainly never published before. And it backfired, because people looked at that and said, well, this is just prurient. This is, this is you know, icky. Is that a legal term? Probably not. <laughs> it may not even be a political term. But basically, icky was the right word. And it, 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 it undercut the case against Clinton, because it did make it about sex. And as long as it was about sex, he was going to win. Well, there's no sex. Yeah, there's, there's no sex in the Nixon story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was it? What was it like in the newsroom? That, that just, as a oh my God. It's, well, we had this. We know? had this big argument. My, my wife, who was my editor at the time, my former editor, yeah, James, former editor, um, you know, had this conversation with Don Graham and 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 Len Downey, who was then the executive editor, about what was going to be published and what we could say, in print, and it was just mind-boggling. It was surreal, and this whole. Eight months leading up to the report had been surreal. They, they, you know, we had arguments over, uh, you know, the blue dress and the, you know, and the, and the cigar and the this and the that. And I don't even want to get into the really icky stuff. Um, and nobody could ever imagine that we were having this conversation. My, 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 my wife actually got in an argument with her boss as to whether we could use the word affair to describe it or not. He said it's not an affair. And she said, Well, what if, what if you learn that he gave her gifts? Okay, it's an affair. You know, we had these bizarre <laughs> definitional arguments about things. What constitutes third base? Oh, God, please. OK. So it's a little different than Nixon. <laughs> but uh, it was very surreal. Well, the, the uh, <laughs> oh God, I, I, you know, I, uh, the, the blue dress is the tapes of, the, of that story. I mean, it is exactly uh, right. The DNA. The DNA. Right. You the have DNA. to have you had incontrovertible. To have... Nixon's DNA was all over his tapes. That's right. <laughs> and, and that and that and that and uh, anyway, oh. where do you go from there? Okay. Um, the reason, by the way, the reason why the the report is is not the reason that it's released, but the reason there is a report in the case of the Clinton impeachment is. What, what happened in the Nixon period. And, the, and there was a real problem, and, 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 it's, and it's actually one of the weaknesses of the impeachment. If you think of impeachment as a safety valve in our Constitution, 
One of the problems is that you have to basically get a guilty president to impeach himself. Because the, the Congress has to rely on the president to hand over the information that they need to determine whether he and someday she uh, should be convicted. Well, wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. The problem is that the process has a flaw in it. If the president continues the obstruction of justice, there's no real way of assuming the Congress will get what it needs. And if it's, there's no way of, of the, for the Congress to get what it needs, then the partisans who are supporting the president will always have the opportunity to say, this information is inconclusive. What helped in the Watergate period was that Nixon got so afraid that he was going to lose his job after the Saturday Night Massacre is that he decided to hand over some tapes voluntarily. The tapes, by the way, that he had fired Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor, over. He decided to hand them over. Now, those tapes included evidence of a felony. And when, the, when, jo when Judge Sirica, who was the presiding judge over the Watergate uh, jury, the grand jury, when he heard one of the tapes, and when Leon Jaworski, who replaced Archibald Cox as a special prosecutor, heard the, the tape, the tape of John Dean talking to Richard Nixon, and John Dean is informing the president that it's, very, it's getting very difficult to keep the Watergate burglars happy and quiet, and it may cost a million dollars, and the president, instead of saying, get the hell out of here, says, a million dollars? That's easy. <laughs> well, for lawyers, that's not only easy, it's a felony. And so you have a special prosecutor and a judge who independently conclude the president of the United States is a felon. The problem is, how do you get rid of him? There was no system by which you could provide this to Congress. They had to invent it. They came up with a, a system which involved a roadmap which basically lays out the information uh, to conclude felony, although it doesn't say that. It doesn't say we're going to indict him, but it's basically the information you would put together to get a grand jury to indict someone. And they gave the tapes to Congress. It's as a result of this very difficult and improvisational system that, that they changed the law governing uh, independent prosecutors so that there would be the opportunity for there to be a systematic reporting right. to Congress. It's as a result of this terrible problem in 74, which is you had this data, but how were you ever going to get it to Congress? And what's interesting is, of course, Ken Starr, under the independent counsel law that comes after Watergate, 1978's passed, is not only uh, uh, empowered, but actually required to send evidence he finds of an impeachable offense to Congress. He's required to do that. Now, what you need to know, not that we're talking about modern day stuff, is the independent counsel law is gone. This is also a bipartisan act because both the Republicans hated it and the Democrats hated it. The Republicans hated it because of Iran Contra and Larry uh, Lawrence Walsh. They thought he was partisan. The Democrats hated it because of Ken Starr. They thought he was partisan. They both conspired to say, let's get rid of this law. So when you hear about Robert Mueller today, he's not an independent counsel. He has a special counsel, which means he works for the Justice Department. He does not have the law that Ken Starr had saying you are obligated to provide information to Congress. So the reason why everybody is talking about this new acting attorney general, Matt Whitaker, is if Matt Whitaker says there's no report, there's no report. Robert Mueller does not have the independent authority to send a report to Congress. Now, my guess is if he writes a report and Matt Whitaker says, I don't think you found anything here that's worth sending to the House of Representatives, that the House of Representatives, which is now in the opposition control, is going to subpoena it. And then we'll have a fight in the courts. We'll see what happens. But because of what Tim just said, the system was kind of screwy in 1974. They had to make it up. And the system was kind of screwy in 1998, and they had to make it up. We're still making it up all over again. We haven't figured out the right way. Before we go to questions, I want to mention one, one interesting part. Um, um, every member of the Judiciary Committee um, in 1974 was a lawyer. And um, a number of them were pressing the president to release material. And uh, we, uh, again, some of these, these wonderful constitutionalists left records of the internal GOP discussion. So we know what they were saying to each other. The, there were members of the GOP who were saying, why is the president um, stonewalling? And they were sending messages to Nixon, please provide information. 
Now, contrast that with Devin Nunes. And it, I think it has to do with training. Devin Nunes is not a lawyer. Is he a lawyer? He's not a lawyer at all. These were all lawyers. They were trained in law schools. They understood evidence. And they knew stonewalling when they saw it. And they didn't want to be party to stonewalling. So what you might find surprising is that members of the Republican Party were putting pressure on the Nixon White House to turn over tapes. The problem for them was that Nixon knew the tapes would show him even more guilty, even guiltier. So Nixon had no interest whatsoever in doing anything but Stonewall. Was there a Stonewall strategy in the Clinton White oh, yeah, House? Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, Clinton basically lies the country for, for seven months. Between January of 1998 and August of 1998, he says to the country, looks in their eyes, says, I did not have sex with that woman. And he tells us this is not true. And it saves him. Arguably, I think the argument. I think my argument has always been that, that the lie, as terrible a lesson as this is, saves him, because by the time August 1998 comes around, and he gets on television, he says, "Well, actually, in fact, we did have a relationship." The country had already processed it. The shock had worn off. People said, "Okay, yeah, we all kind of figured that. You know, thanks. Uh, we're, we're tired of this. Stop talking about this. Let's move on." Right? If it had happened in January, if he had actually admitted the truth in January, he might have been forced out right then and there by pressure from within his own party. In fact, that's where Dick Morris comes in. You mentioned Dick Morris at the beginning, the campaign. Bill Clinton calls Dick Morris, his, his consultant, and he says, you got to take a poll for me, or, or, or Morris offers to take a poll for him, and shows that the public would accept sex, but they wouldn't accept lying under oath or obstruction of justice. And it's from that poll that Clinton says, OK, well, then we just have to win. In other words, we have to fight this out like a political battle. And he did. I, I want to. Turn to questions in a second. In a second, but Peter mentioned the shock factor had sort of worn off over those months. One of the reasons you write that the tapes were so devastating was the shock factor. I think today the American people are much more cynical about politicians, and we sort of we we just we a lot of people assume the worst of their politicians. But I think people, including on on the Hill, were genuinely shocked to hear what Nixon was saying. Obviously. You know, he ostensibly went farther than than others do. But can you talk about what that was, kind of the the relative innocence of the American people and how that was shattered by that? Well, period? there was well there was a there was a huge debate in the White House over whether to release the tapes, uh, the, the the tapes that had been subpoenaed, and there were people on one side who said the American people who support Nixon will continue to support Nixon regardless. And there were others who said, no, 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 the American people don't know how amoral he is. <laughs> they don't know what kind of real, what man, because he has consistently presented a certain facade which will not be supported by the real Nixon. As I said, his DNA is all over the tapes. Expletive deleted. <laughs> and so what happens is in the end, Nixon agrees to release transcripts that are generated in the White House. These transcripts are terrible. But I, I ran a, a tapes project at the University of Virginia, the Miller Center, and it's hard to do good transcripts. And these were done in a half-assed way, and then President Nixon himself edited them. <laughs> yes, he did. He took them up to the residence, and he went through them, and he, been, and he decided that each time he used a swear word that it should be removed, and, and in, in, instead the, the redaction would say expletive deleted. <laughs> well, Richard Nixon. Actually, I don't know, not a lot of them were F-bombs. Actually, John F. Kennedy used more F-bombs than Nixon. But he used goddamn, damn it, damn, damn, all the time. And each one of those is removed. So when you read the transcript, it looked like this guy was using F-bombs all the time. In addition to that, it was deeply amoral. You never heard Nixon, or at least read Nixon, because the, the tapes actually themselves weren't released, the, the audio, for years. You never saw him say, what would be good for the country? It was rah, 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 damn them, damn them all. I mean, they don't understand me. I, isn't that true, Henry? Oh, Mr. President, they, they, they don't really understand you, particularly the Jews. I know, Henry. No, I mean, it's, it's all that. And people just couldn't, couldn't believe it. It was on and on and on. And so, so it was a PR fiasco. And the Republicans almost pushed him out. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a re resignation crisis in the spring of 74 when Republicans, uh, John Rhodes of, of Arizona, and other Republicans were saying Richard Nixon should consider resignation. 
You, you never hear that from partisans, right? But they thought this is too much. The American people, the difference between the Nixon they had elected and the Nixon on the transcripts was so stark, the Republicans started worrying about the midterm elections of 74. Well, Nixon was not gonna resign. So when he doesn't resign, Republicans throw up their hands and decide, well, we gotta get, go through with this impeachment process. So it was, it was, it, it was the reality, in the case of, of, of Clinton, Amer the American people seemed to like him more. In the case of Nixon, the more they learned about him, the less they liked him. Um, it's just different presidents, different times. I, I think part of it, of course, was a naivete about presidents. But I do believe this about lying. I think that what, what Nixon's, uh, Nixon lied all the time. But, but what he did was he built up his lies so that um, when the smoking gun conversation came out, the reason it was a smoking gun conversation was that over and over again, he had said, I did not use the CIA to blunt the FBI's investigation. And that became a very important truth that he said. And when that turned out to be false, everything collapsed. So if a president lies consistently about one element of the story and the truth comes out, I don't care how um, cynical the American people have become, I think they will lose a lot of support. And, and the Trump example is collusion. What has he always said? I didn't collude, I didn't collude, I didn't collude. And if there is evidence that he colluded, I think the American people will react very strongly. I might, I, I, I would offer a caveat, which is I think that they have, the American people have already digested so much with this president, and anything short of his voice on tape or a DNA of some sort, the equivalent of that, he has the opportunity to say, that's fake. Oh yeah, that's true. And he has a way of discrediting yeah. things that seem like pretty convincing evidence. And what's really striking about Trump and Nixon is that Trump has done out loud things that Nixon sought to hide, yeah. right? So he, not only he fired the FBI director, he told us he was thinking about the Russia investigation when he did it. Not only did he fire the attorney general just last week, he told us again and again. It was because he recused himself from the Russia investigation and therefore could not protect him, right? And so uh, he does on Twitter what Nixon did in his tapes. Yeah, but we didn't hear the tapes on the evening news every night. And what's interesting about that is Again, the shock thing is different. It's because we've come to get used to, to, to Trump violating norms, things other presidents haven't done, things that people tut tut and say, well, we're not supposed to do that kind of thing. After a while, it just becomes sort of normal. And so I don't know what will then be so shocking to the system that it changes people's perspectives. My concern is the proof side of it. I think that you can find something, I mean, that one could find something theoretically shocking enough to the system where the American people would say, that's enough lying. My concern is what you just said, Peter, which is how do you prove it? I mean, the tapes were a magnificent vehicle to prove that Richard Nixon was abusing power and obstructing justice. The Nick, the tape, without the tapes, I'm quite convinced Nixon would have finished the second term. And without the blue dress, it would have been a he said, she said story in the case of Clinton. What, kind, what would be the evidence that would be required? And I believe the bar is very high. So that's my concern, um, if indeed the president has engaged in obstruction of justice or abuse of power or any other felony, that, that we won't get the kind of proof that the American people are gonna need because he has numbed us to alternative sources of information. Let's go to questions. Anyone? I have a hundred more I could ask, so we could, <laughs> go, I get wherever you want, up, maybe up her. Oh, okay. so go ahead, right, cool. she, she has a microphone right here. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you can go back to the point about censure and why it wasn't used against Bill Clinton and like, so you said it's more of an admonishment, correct, rather than actual course for action, which is sort of what impeachment has kind of become to some extent, because it's more of a symbolic act rather than actually the gestation of getting a president out of office. So what, was it mostly because it was trying to um, energize the Democrats and make it a partisan affair that kind of led to the um, revulsion against censure as a possible option, or was it for another reason? Well, so you're right. A censure is a statement rather than a, 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 an action, right? Censure does not cause something to happen. Uh, 
It does not change the president's tenure in office. It does not uh, inhibit his powers in any way. Um, but it was seen, I think, at the time of being something that would be a historical marker. Uh, that if both parties came together and said, this we will not approve of, this we find to be unacceptable. Uh, and Clinton went back and forth on this. You know, at various points he did entertain the idea of censure as a way of getting around impeachment. Uh, at other times he resisted it, he didn't like this idea. In fact, people kept coming up with variations on it. We'll have censure plus a fine, <laughs> right? Go to pay some money. <laughs> That'll be okay, right? That was one. <laughs> Censure, but you have to actually say these words. I was bad, you have to write on a chalkboard. Whatever, there were variations everybody kept trying to come up with. At one point in the Senate, uh, some of the senators, Republican senators, came up with the idea of findings of fact. And that would be that the Senate, which wouldn't convict him, would vote to say, we determined these to be the facts that happened. All right, in other words, he did lie under oath, he did obstruct justice, he did lie to the American people, blah, blah, blah. But we're not gonna remove him from office. And that this. Findings of fact would be a statement for history and be bipartisan. So they kept looking for an out. They kept looking for an out because they didn't think, many of them didn't think, including Republicans, didn't really think it necessarily added up to removal from office because it did feel kind of like somewhere in the middle, right? But you didn't want to endorse the idea that it's okay to lie under oath. Look, all the people, a lot of people who got convicted in Watergate and a lot of people who've gotten convicted around Trump so far, have been convicted of lying, basically. Not the actual underlying events themselves. So then you say, okay, well, it doesn't matter that, pres that President of the United States lies? Well, you don't want to say that either. So that's why people were looking for a middle ground like censure. Tom DeLay didn't want there to be a middle ground. He wanted there to be impeachment. He wouldn't allow a vote. He knew if there was a vote, there would be a, a, a swarm that would end up going with censure. So he refused to allow. He uses power in the House leadership to, uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, and what ended up happening, of course, I think in a way you're right, what ends up happening is he's impeached by the House, acquitted by the Senate, and in effect it is stood as kind of a statement of censure in the history books, right? And in fact, Newt Gingrich, who was the speaker at the time, later said, well, this is probably, the end result is probably what it probably should have been. The country didn't want a removal, but the impeachment stands as a mark of disapproval. Now the problem is because it was a partisan vote, it's not a bipartisan mark of disapproval. And you have President Clinton for years afterwards to say, I'm proud of what happened during impeachment. I stood up for the Constitution. I stood up against these power-hungry, crazy uh, Republicans. Instead of saying, I did something wrong, I'm, I you know, was held accountable for it, and, and we should all learn a lesson from it. Did you know? they ever consider censure? With well, the, the middle group, uh, they called, uh, some of them called them actually your paper. The New York Times called them the fragile coalition. The first thing they, when they finally got together, these are Republicans and Democrats who met secretly, they said, should we censure Richard Nixon? That was the first thing they asked each other. And they said, no, because he, it's, what he's done is worse than that. Um, I really hope that impeachment does not become a mark of Cain. I think it's something, it's a very useful safety valve. Uh, the whole point is to prevent the United States from having a tyrant. That's why it's there. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be like those votes against the Affordable, Affordable Care Act that the Republicans used to take every so often just to prove that they could, even though they knew that it would have, it would have actual, ab absolutely no practical effect. That's not what we want impeachment to be. We have other ways to show that we don't like our president. What would happen if it wasn't um, collusion and it was just straight out money laundering and financial crimes? Oh, well, somebody killed during Nixon, right? I mean, there were, there were issues with Nixon that involved there, things that were not directly related to his office, but were crimes, right? Oh, absolutely. Actually, one, um, one of the big differences, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not predicting anything. Uh, historians are very bad at prediction. But one of the problems for the Nixon dirty tricksters was that, was that they, had, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, and Nixon probably could go to his two, he had two friends. Uh, and one of them wasn't his dog. His dog didn't like him. <laughs> no, no, there's a very funny, I have to tell you, the, it, the dog didn't like to come towards him, so Alexander Butterfield used to be standing behind the president with dog biscuits, because so the the they wanted to take pictures. Look, when their dog doesn't like you, that says something. Anyway, his two best friends had money, but by and large, they didn't have a lot of money, and they had this one leftover account with about $350,000. And it was an account that was run by the chief of staff. So you imagine all the problems they got into to try to move money out of that account. And that would later hurt them, big time. Whereas 
uh, President Trump has something called the Trump Organization, which is a private source of funding, which should there be such a, an issue of money laundering or payoffs or what have you, in addition to the ones we know, that involve a private company, that those might have been done in a, in a way that's more difficult to, um, to prove. But that's very different. The Nixon, Nixon was stuck engaging in, thank goodness, in, tr in dirty tricks uh, because he, he could only do so much because he could only afford so much. Whereas the story is different now should the current president be in, in the same mindset. Do I think money laundry would be enough? Involving a foreign power, absolutely. That would come under bribery, th theoretically, or treason. Even if it was before. Oh, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so Peter, you say. Tell us what you think. <laughs> well, I think that the framers did say that the corrupt election of a president would be grounds for impeachment, okay? So there were, very, there were two things they were really most worried about, actually, was the corrupt election of a president. In other words, you did something for the, you know, to, de to defraud the, the system to get elected. Because otherwise, why would, if, you, if you allowed that person to stay in office, you, know, you have rewarded the corruption. So the impeachment was very specifically aimed at that. The second thing that they had in mind was, was, the, was a foreign, the influence of foreign powers. So I think if you could prove something that involved uh, the election in a foreign power, you're, you're well within the normal constitutional conversation that was being had. Um, let's try a different one, though. Let's just say this hush money that's been written about paid to these women not tell their stories, OK? Would that be an impeachable offense? Interesting question, right? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer either. You could make the argument that it was, it was a corruption of the election. If, if they could make it a, be a campaign finance law violation, which they tried against John Edwards, he was not convicted. Um, maybe. Again, that gets closer to the Clinton thing. Well, it's about sex. Does that count? He wanted to protect his wife. So you know, it really depends on what you're talking about. What kind of money laundering? What kind of financial crimes? Does it involve the election? Does it involve foreign powers? Um, and, and we don't know the answer to some of these. Right the now. other one that's, that's even more gray is emoluments, you know, which we kind of are in plain sight. The Constitution does ban emoluments. That's a, a, you know, there's an ongoing legal fight about it. But the president is taking money from foreign governments through the Trump Organization and the Trump Hotel. But is that an impeachable offense? That, you know, that, would Congress consider that an impeachable offense? Would a Democratic House use that as one of 15 grounds of impeachment? That it's potentially, if there's a list of 15 things, they could tack that on. But like Tim said, there were a lot of liberals in the 70s who wanted to impeach Nixon for bombing Cambodia. Breathing, and, for actually you know, breathing. Right, and, and, as, and as John Meacham writes so memorably on, in the Andrew Johnson chapter of this book, uh, a lot of people wanted to impeach Andrew Johnson for not being Abraham Lincoln. Yes. You know, that's <laughs> but one of the things that's uh, so interesting uh, from the Nixon period is that when the Congress got evidence of, of the felony that, that both the judge, Judge Sirica, and the special prosecutor felt was, was enough to say that Nixon was unsuited to be president, uh, Congress didn't think it was enough. And in fact, John Doerr, who was the, who was the leader, who was the, the, the counsel who led the inquiry, he said, the American people are not going to throw a president who was elected by a landslide out because he did something bad on one day. Now, uh, and this was that conversation that Nixon had. And he said, we need more. We have to establish a pattern of misconduct. So, so I think that it depends on how, how much evidence there is and whether it's a, a sustained period of, of badness. But I, I think that the, it's not just the two-thirds majority that's required in the Senate. I think the nation has to almost conclude that the president should leave. Right. So think of how hard that is given our divisions today. And I think that's, yeah, besides th the evidence issue, I think that's going to be the greater problem. I, I think the one lesson you take from the Nixon and the Clinton impeachments is a partisan impeachment doesn't work. Doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You know, even if you had, as they did in the Johnson case, enough votes in one party to have two thirds of the vote, it didn't work. You have to be able to convince the party of the presidents uh, that there is something really wrong here, that they themselves should feel betrayed by their own president. Otherwise, it's just going to be seen as illegitimate. Well, because remember that impeachment is an undemocratic act. The American people have selected this person as president. And you are going to. I was going to say Trump, but I won't use that, overturn an election. And, and you, you can't do that lightly. 
Which is why you hear Jim, Jim Comey, who's no fan of the president, say, I would rather they have an election and vote him out than have impeachment. But we'll see. Hi. Um, given what you said, you know, with respect to Nixon not living his crimes out loud to the public, so when the evidence of the crimes were um, exposed, that people were shocked and wanted him to end his presidency. Given that Trump has largely lived his crimes out loud, you know, and possibly we know of light treason, at least by his family and his campaign, if if there are if there is evidence of real crimes, because I think we've all forgotten more than we remember right now, um, that Mueller knows of, I know there's a DOJ policy that says you can't indict a president, but if you know, to the extent that the Mueller judges the um, Congress or the legislative branch to be too feckless because it is ruled by a group that has a minority point of view, do you think he would indict the president? Uh, my understanding, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so don't hold me to this. My understanding is that I don't think he can. In other words, because he is an employee of the Justice Department who answers to the Attorney General, uh -huh. or until now the Acting Attorney General in terms of Rod Rosenstein uh -huh. serving that function, now Matt Whitaker, that he is obligated to follow the policy of the Justice Department, which as has been crystallized by the Office of Legal Counsel Opinion, is that a sitting president cannot be indicted. So, so I, don't think he has the, I don't think he has the ability to overturn department policy by himself. But does Rosenstein have that ability? Well, I, not anymore. No, well, uh, to the extent that he might have required or sought a different opinion by the Office of Legal Counsel, mm -hmm. perhaps, but now, of course, he's no longer able to do that. The, what I don't know the answer to, and, and there may be lawyers in the room who know better, is whether there could be an indictment that is pending him leaving office. Mm -hmm. In other words, just because you can't be indicted in office doesn't mean you can't be indicted for a crime, and then the, the proceedings would then be frozen in effect until you were no longer president. That was always talked about during uh, Clinton, I don't know about Nixon. Well, the problem there is then you get into the issue, can the president pardon himself? Right. Um, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure that Mueller couldn't indict the president it, were he to, because it's not Mueller indicting the president, it's a grand jury. And what if a grand jury wants to indict the president? I mean, after all, the, the Watergate grand jury wanted to indict Nixon. What the special prosecutor decided uh, over, by the way, the advice of all the members of his team, all the members of his team thought a president could be indicted. There's no law that says a president can't. Um, but uh, the special prosecutor decided, no, I, since the impeachment proceedings have already started in the House, I'll let them run their course. But what I'll do is I'll make, I'll, give the option to the grand jury of making Nixon an unindicted co-conspirator. And you might say, well, why? Because that meant the conversations on the tapes uh, could be introduced as evidence. Otherwise, it's hearsay. If he was not inside the conspiracy, then that's hearsay. You make him part of the conspiracy, and then you can use Haldeman's words that he was chief of staff against Haldeman in the trials to come. So there was an evidentiary reason to make him an unindicted co-conspirator. And you certainly could do that. Now, if need be. By the way, we, we, what people often forget about the Clinton case is there actually was a question about whether he would be indicted after leaving office, regardless of the Senate vote. And Robert Ray, who was Ken Starr's successor as an independent counsel, ended up cutting a deal with Bill Clinton's lawyer, who was sealed in the last 24 hours of his presidency, in which they agreed not to pr press charges against Bill Clinton. And in exchange, he acknowledged that he had not told the truth under oath. And he agreed to forfeit his law license, and he paid uh, a fine. Uh, it wasn't a particularly big fine, uh, but in effect, he admitted some culpability. He was also, by the way, held accountable in a different way. The judge in the Paula Jones case held him in contempt for lying under oath, which had never happened by any, in, to any president before or after that, and fined him an uh, uh, amount of money I've for now forgotten as well. And he ended up having to settle the Paula Jones lawsuit for more than she originally asked for. So he did pay a price. Um, but you're right, it's an interesting question. And Richard Nixon got a pardon, but he didn't get a pardon for future crimes. And he was, uh, we, we, we have his uh, deposition, he was later deposed um, by the grand jury uh, for, for the trial of his lieutenants. And he lied under oath in that. 
but the, the U.S. government for, for some reason decided not to prosecute him. But I think he could have been prosecuted as a former president for lying under oath. Thank you for an excellent historical perspective on impeachment. I have a forward-looking question. There's enough case history on the impeachment process. Should the amendment or should the Constitution be amended to look at all these case histories and saying, what should be done to avoid these long process legal procedures so that there's a much more simplistic view and how can one have a president sitting in office for two years and bashing, if you will, the world, the economy, and the American people? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. The problem, I think, is not the Constitution. The problem is that these investigations just take a long time. And that proving the kinds of things that Robert Mueller has been asked to prove um, is incredibly complicated. It involves, in his case, it involves foreign intelligence, uh, Ta you know, whatever surveillance they have of, uh, in a different language, making sure that not only the language understood, but the nuances are understood. It involves financial obligation, financial transactions that are can be extraordinarily complicated. Money laundering is not easy to prove because it is directly intended to avoid uh, uh, d detection. So, you know, you're right. It's incredibly frustrating to have an investigation drag on so long. I don't think a constitutional amendment would remedy that because you still need to have the evidence to convince not only the Senate, or, uh, but the public, as Tim said. And it's, it's just the nature of our investigations these days that they, that they drag on longer than they, we would like them to. And keep in mind that the Mueller investigation is not an impeachment investigation. It's a criminal investigation. There are a number of issues that an impeachment inquiry would be interested in which are not felonies, which are questions of abuse of power, which, um, I mean, again, should, should an impeachment inquiry start, that's something that they will look into. So Mueller is a criminal investigation, and it's not just about the president, it's about anybody who might have committed a crime with regard to Russian intervention in our 2016 election. But just, sorry, just as one point, should the Constitution be changed that the president is obligated to file a check? Ah, okay. well, the question for anybody who didn't hear it is, should the Constitution be amended to obligate the president to release his tax returns, as this president has not done that? As a reporter, I would say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in favor of amending the Constitution to say all kinds of things the president should be releasing. Um, but um, they could probably do that by statute. I don't know that they necessarily need a constitutional amendment to do that. And it may be something that comes up depending on how this plays out. I think, I think one, there are a lot of norms that President Trump has altered. And previous, uh. leaders, previous leaders wouldn't have tried it because of their concern about sanction, being sanctioned by the American people. It all depends on how this presidency ends. If it ends well for President Trump, then I, I would say that many of these norms are gone because there will be many Trumps for a decade or two. If this presidency ends badly, then I think this effort to up, uh, turn over and re rewrite and change and deny norms will have been a failure and candidates will start uh, releasing their tax returns again. Let's take one more question from someone who hasn't gotten to ask one. Okay, this may bring you back to your original question, uh, your original statement, but um, if we don't have a special prosecutor anymore with his own line of funding, you know, from Congress and mission, that's uh, under the control of, you know, the acting attorney general now who can you know, not only just keep him from writing his report or getting his report out, but also can just cut off his funding so he can't get any more evidence. And I think, I think that was in the Washington Post or somewhere, because I remember reading about that being a concern. Then how on earth will we ever be able to get the evidence in a case like this, which is actually incredibly uh, complicated, as you say, and very, very serious if it doesn't involve like a treasonous act, which is high crimes, okay, <laughs> as opposed to the misdemeanor, <laughs> um, you know, probably has a lot of national security implications, you know, so all that information's, you know, top secret and everything. I mean, what are we, what are we going to rely on? What is the American public going to rely on then? 
uh, you yeah. know, congressional hearing, <laughs> you know, uh, WikiLeaks, power. <laughs> WikiLeaks uh, Washington Post reporter no, that WikiLeaks. gets, you know, <laughs> you know, in touch with the right guy in some garage somewhere. OK, so, you know, what's going to happen in the future? Because without that evidence, the, the po politics of this is just not going to go anywhere because they're going to have nothing to talk about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about it. We have not figured out how to have accountability for our president. That's still something we're reinventing all the time. We didn't like the way it worked out in Watergate, so we had the independent counsel. We didn't like the way it worked out with the Clinton case, so we now have this, this version of a special prosecutor. People would probably not say we're all that happy with the way this one has worked out because you don't know that he's going to maintain that independence and autonomy. Had it been somebody with less backbone than Robert Mueller, they might have already folded under the pressure that that office has been put under. Pretty extraordinary by a president. Much more so, even Clinton trashed Starr, and Nixon obviously had his moments, certainly Spiro Agnew went after. But nobody has done what this president has done uh, in terms of trying to discredit an investigator. And Bob Mueller has just stood up there and not let it stop him. But I don't know what the system that we could come up with that would effectively build a structure that would guarantee independence that the branches of government could live with, right? The problem that they didn't like about the independent counsel was he didn't answer to anybody. And so if he decided to sort of, you know, keep sprawling this investigation on forever, nobody liked that system either because it meant that it, you had a sort of a heat seeking missile that would keep going until it found a hot target, yeah. right? Forever, years and years and years, which is also not necessarily healthy to the system. So how do you have an independent, credible uh, uh, prosecutor who can't be shut down for political reasons? without having sort of a permanent investigator who lives throughout every presidency from start to finish? I don't know. Well, I think, I, I think we are protected in the sense of when crimes are involved, there's a whole, so far our, our, our judiciary is, in, is, in, is, is strong. You know, if you, we, there are, we've been through a stress test as a nation, and a lot of our institutions have done pretty darn well, if you think about it. I mean, after all, in most countries, the president's best friend, his private lawyer, all right, would have been treated very differently from Michael Cohen. Think about most, in most, not, not democracies, but most of the countries, sadly, in this, country, in this world are not democracy. So our institutions have been done pretty well. Um, so I don't worry so much about getting access to criminal information. Uh, I suspect uh, if, if he needed it, Mr. Mueller has Donald Trump's tax returns. I suspect he has Donald Trump Jr.'s tax returns. I suspect that they're invest and, and if there is evidence of a felony, I suspect they will go to a grand jury. Because if they don't, they are engaged in obstruction of justice. Remember that, that they are, we do have an independent judiciary. Now, I'm not naive about these things. things. My concern is the evidence, is the nature of the evidence, if the evidence will be strong or not. But if, if, if the criminal act involves something that could be wiretapped, something that could be observed, not wiretapped, but something could be observed, something that could, then I suspect that Mueller has access to that information. Um, what is not necessarily going to happen is the, the, some of the other stuff that the Nixon administration did, which was to use parts of the administration to go after enemies. Um, that, that, we found out about because Americans stood up and said, we won't do this for you. Um, um, my colleague, Mike Konsowitz, just wrote a beautiful book called so They Said No to Nixon. And it's about good government Republicans who said no in the IRS, who said no in OMB, who said no in various places. And then they kept records. And now I don't know whether that's happening. We know about the Washington, the New York Times, there is one person at least, or was it the Washington, there was it the New York Times, yeah, the New York Times yeah. piece. But those people provided evidence of abuse of power, of enemies lists and things like that. Now, if there are people like that in our government right now, that's being collected. And, and I suspect that will find its way out. So I, I, I actually am quite hopeful that if indeed the president is engaging in felonious acts, that we will learn about it. Well, and with that, we'll, we'll wrap. Time will tell, as they say in the cliche. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much, Tim Naftali, Peter Baker. Really good conversation. Nice to be able to unpack some of these issues. Thank you for the great questions.